Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Becoming You podcast. This week, I am bringing to you an episode where I was interviewed by another amazing podcast host. Um, his name is John Wang, and he is an educator, speaker, a certified coach who specializes in working with Asian Americans on inner work, their mindset, and their communication skills. I was on his podcast which is called Big Asian Energy, and I am sharing this powerful interview. So on this episode, we unpacked how Asian culture makes us believe that our worth is solely tied to our achievements and productivity. And we start to believe that our value is measured through external validation, what others think of us. And then this belief system leads to self-doubt and a disconnection from our true selves. So we dive deep into inner child work, the emotional wounds that we incur as children, and how breath work can really free us of this experience and the narratives we tell ourselves that we can step into our truest, biggest versions of ourselves. So listen to this week's powerful episode and enjoy. Visa, welcome to the show. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. Oh my gosh. Yeah, me too. I'm so excited to have you. Visa, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your journey, how you got here? Yeah, absolutely. So I was the typical Indian girl who earned the reputation of being the good girl. Like I was always so good at school and I prided myself on that reputation of just being good, right? And I did all the things you're supposed to do to create the happy life, which is go to school, do your best, get into a great college then go get a job that pays you really well and then get married and have kids. I literally did all of it in that order. And then I just kept waking up with, I had two babies and I just kept waking up and I kept thinking, oh my God, like I've done everything I'm supposed to do, but I'm unhappy. But there was really nothing wrong with my marriage and I had my health. So I had everything on paper that looked fantastic. But on the inside, I literally felt like it's going to sound very dramatic, like I was dying. Because every day I'd wake up and I'd think, surely there's more to life than this. And the amount okay. of shame that came attached with that thought was also horrible. So to how you started off the podcast, I had a job at Microsoft at this point. And from the outside, it was everything like people were coveting it, right? Oh my God, you work for Microsoft, amazing benefits, amazing pay, whatever. And I thought, no, it's the job that's making me really unhappy. So I thought, I'm going to quit this job, which at the time sounded absolutely crazy and impulsive, but I didn't know what else to do. So I did that. And then I thought, and that didn't make me happy because right. now I was lonely and not making any money. So then I thought, I'll just go start a business. That's what I need to do. I need to make money. That'll make me happy. So then I started a business, which wasn't my coaching business at the, what I'm currently doing. It was a sleep consulting business. I did that for a couple of years. Sleep consulting business? Yeah, it was teaching parents with young babies how to sleep independently. So they weren't sleep deprived. Oh my gosh. Okay, I, I want to hear more about that. But let's start from the beginning. So you said that you were from India originally, is that right? Yeah, and we're about in India. I grew up in the south of India. Tamil Nadu is the state that I grew up in and I lived there until I was 11. And then I moved to the UK because my dad decided he wanted to pursue his career there. And then I got married and then I moved to the US. Did you do your schooling in the UK or in the US? It was both in India and the UK. And then when I came to the US, I was doing my master. I decided to do my master's here in the US after I got married. Got it. What did you do your master's in? I got an MBA. It was a master's in business admin. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, great. So like you literally were checking off all the good Asian kid boxes, weren't you? I really was. <laughs> I was like top three in undergrad, top 10 in MBA, like in terms of where I graduated. You did the thing that your parents expected. You were, you're growing up, you went to the top, you're top of your class, you graduated, you got a job at Microsoft. What were you doing at Microsoft? I was in digital advertising. So I had the fancy job of whining and dining clients and trying to Oh win my business. God. This is an interesting thing because you, up until this point, you are the success story of, I would imagine, so many parents having immigrated all the way to different countries to 
first and foremost to the UK and then to America. I am so curious. I wish that I could ask your parents how, what their thoughts were about when you quit your job, but I'm sure we can get into that. And then to see you here in North America, get into this fancy digital advertising job at Microsoft. And then one day you just woke up and you said, no, I'm done with it. You know, when you're wringing a t-shirt, like a wet t-shirt and you're just twisting and it's getting pulled in different directions. I would say that was probably akin to what I was feeling on the inside oh because there was this incredible job that supported us financially, what, helping us save for retirement, for our kids' college, pay for our mortgage, our vacations, everything. And then there was the part of me that said, that doesn't matter because you're so deeply unhappy, let it go. Yeah. And I was like, which one do I listen to? Yeah. And it must have been scary, I'd imagine, right? You had this very secure, very stable job. Did you think about, let me just keep toughing it out? And I think that the biggest thing is you had kids as well. And I think so many parents who have kids go through that moment of, yes, I hate my job, but a few actually take that leap. So I want to come back to that moment. I want to hear about that moment where you decided that morning of just, I'm done and I'm writing this letter of resignation, I'm submitting it. What was that day like for you? That day was actually filled with a lot of shame and guilt because it was choosing between what I thought was going to lead to my happiness. I thought quitting my job would lead me to my happiness or choosing the happiness of my own family. To me, it felt like a zero sum game. If I chose my happiness, it meant that I was letting my family down. And if I chose my family, it felt like I was letting myself down, which is why I felt so ashamed and so guilty because ultimately I chose me. Wow. And that felt incredibly selfish, especially as a woman, when you're told that it's okay, your happiness comes from your family's happiness. That's what I was fed, the messaging we are told as women, right? Our worth comes from how happy you make your family. And so when I decided to choose myself, it was going against everything that I had learned, picked up along the way, for my culture, for my family, from generations. Did your family support the decision at the time or was there a lot of naysaying back and forth? My parents are really amazing in the sense that once I am I was married, they don't really get involved in family decisions. They're not mm -hmm. nosy in that sense. So they, I'm sure they were shocked and they probably thought I was making a terribly wrong decision, which I would come to regret later. But they would say things like, are you sure? you can't get this job back once you let it go. So really loving things, but you can tell like, what is the messaging behind it? Mm -hmm. And then there was my husband. I, we've been married for almost 20 years and I have been incredibly blessed with the type of man I chose to marry. It was an arranged marriage. Let's not let, that's a whole nother episode in itself. But he is one of the really good guys. He was confused. He was shocked. He didn't really like the decision I was making, but he also said, it's we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. So many of the decisions I've made since then have not made any sense to him. I'd imagine for a lot of people, it would definitely, I'm sitting here thinking about that because what it sounds like it was a decision made between kind of this idea of let me pursue my passion or let me pursue something that my heart really sings to this path that you work so hard to get. And props to your husband first and foremost, because I think a lot of people's partners may not be comfortable with the decision that you made. So props to him for saying, I don't understand it, but I support you in doing what you did. Did you know that you were going to do entrepreneurship or become a coach or any of these things? Or At the time I quit, I had zero plans. I just knew I need to stop doing what I'm doing right now. There was a net to catch me, which is in the sense that my husband was still earning, right? So in that sense, I'm very privileged. I will acknowledge that. But I had no, I had zero plans. And within two months of me quitting and being at home and becoming a stay-at-home mom is when the idea started forming off. I didn't enjoy working for someone. So what if I decided to work for myself? What would that look like? And when you start asking the right questions, I'm a big believer in spirituality. The universe delivers the answer. It opens a door and then you start to go through that door and you think, what if this is the thing I've been looking for? And that's how I got into sleep consulting. Okay, yeah. So let's hear about sleep consulting because can you go to school for becoming a sleep consultant? Is that a thing? I love this phrase. I came up with this idea. I'm sure it's not an original idea that from your biggest pain comes your power. Oh, I love that. From your biggest more. pain comes your power. At that time in my life, my biggest pain was sleep deprivation because my son was not sleeping through the night. And so 
obviously as a new mother, you're the only one who can feed your baby and comfort your baby and put your baby to sleep. So he had a lot of like needed to be held. He was a colicky baby. I was miserable and partly depressed because of the sleep deprivation as well. Oh. So I found this sleep program. It was a self-study program that I purchased online and I used the program and I started to get my child to sleep independently. And it was life changing. When you go from sleeping really well to not sleeping at all, and then to go back to sleep, it feels like a rebirth. And I was like, oh my God, sleep is so important. And just at that time, the woman who created that self-study course was inviting people to learn how to become a sleep consultant themselves. And she was like, if you're a stay-at-home mom, this could be a great stream of income for you. And that's how I got into it. So I flew down to Florida, got trained by her, and I invested quite a bit of money learning how to become a sleep consultant. And it was my first step into what does it mean to run your own business? And what was that like for you? It's just oh, suddenly my. be a business owner all of a sudden. It was the most uncomfortable period <laughs> of my life because when you start your own business, all the demons come out of yourself. Entrepreneurship, I truly feel. Yes, we all get into it because we want to make money, but it's really a personal development journey. Every <laughs> challenge, every personal belief and block that you have will show up through your business, whether you want to face it or not. A lot of my own self-confidence issues, self-doubt, procrastination, self-criticism, like the negative self-talk, all of it became very amplified and polarized during that period. It would kill me to pick up the phone and call pediatrician's offices to get a meeting. And I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I'd be like, nope, nope, I got to find another way. And so my business didn't do very well. I tried to make it successful for three years. Like I didn't get very far. And then when I did get clients, I'd be like, what? Like, how did you find me? Can I do this? <laughs> my confidence was terrible. Yeah. I can imagine the struggle because we were talking about this earlier, but it's a mindset. Entrepreneurship is a trial by fire of seeing every single one of your self-doubts wake up with you and beat you over the head with it. And you have to fight through that and then show up for work because there's no structure. That's right. But I had some crazy things happen. Like I got invited to be on a morning TV segment to talk about sleep consulting, but I had no mm -hmm. idea how to leverage these things at the time. Mm -hmm. It was literally just shooting paint at the wall, seeing what mm -hmm. sticks. So I was getting burnt out with sleep consulting, which then led me into network marketing. I decided to try that as a next step, which network marketing is really 100% personal growth and self-development journey. Mm -hmm. And then I did that for three years. And then that eventually led me to coaching because I realized linking back to my original story, everything was making me unhappy. No matter what I tried, the unhappiness still stuck. That is the one thing I couldn't change. That is the point in my life I started to realize nothing mm. in my external world is changing what's happening inside of me. So maybe I need to go inside. When you say go inside, you mean to look at the beliefs and what the stories were. Yeah, at the time, I didn't even know that's what it was. I just knew something is going on in the internal landscape in the way I think mm -hmm. and the thoughts I have. Something invisible to me is getting in the way of creating the life I want. What is it's, that in invisible thing? It's such an interesting thing because I think so many of us, you know, especially when we're starting up in our careers, things seem almost simple. You get the job, the fancy job at Microsoft, and you get happy. Or you finish a degree and you get happy. You finish the MBA and you become happy. Or you get married to become happy. You have kids and you become happy. But at every single stage, or even if I quit my job, then I'll be happy. But the truth is every single stage, the demons that have walked through us, if I've walked with us, they don't go away just because we're changing our environment. So you start working with a life coach. What did you learn from that? It was life shattering because she opened my eyes to the way I talk to myself when I'm not even listening to myself. That internal chatter, she was the one who first woke me up to the fact that you do have an internal voice and listen to what is it saying. The way I talked to myself back then I thought was completely normal. And that's how most people talk to themselves, which is Oh my God, you can't even do this. It was really negative and harsh. But to me, I didn't know that. I was just like, isn't this how everybody talks to themselves to improve? She said, no, a lot of your unhappiness comes from the way you treat yourself. I wrangled with that idea for many months. I refused to believe her. I was like, no, it's not that simple. <laughs> Why is it so hard for us to see that? Because I think it's been such an integral part of how we speak to ourselves from a very young age. 
it's like a muscle that has become so strong that now when someone's telling you this muscle is actually not helping you be healthy, it shifts your entire perspective. And a lot of times we don't want to let go of our perspective of how we see the world. Because then right. if you're wrong about that, what else are you wrong about? Oh, God. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And we, we don't want to be wrong. Nobody likes to be wrong. <laughs> no, I've never experienced that because I've never been wrong before. So that's been yeah. nice. But it's so true though. We're such creatures of habit, right? Like we wake up every single day and we do the same habitual things. And our thoughts are also habits. In a lot of ways, we have a habit of the thoughts that come up and we have the habits of dismissing that. So at this stage, what would you say was the habitual thought that was showing up in your head that was creating this internal struggle? If I really went all the way down to the core of it, it is mm -hmm. I don't measure up. I will never measure up. I'm mm -hmm. not good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't have what it takes. So it all boils down to the unworthiness. I think at some level, we all yeah. carry this fear I'm just not good enough and I don't have what it takes. I think those are the two biggest, deepest fears that we all really have is I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy. Yes. And those are, of course, deeply interlinked to each other. On the surface level, it shows up as self-criticism and self-doubt and procrastination and perfectionism. How do those two things tie together? Okay, so if we have this deep wound of, oh my gosh, I'm just not good enough. When you're going about in your everyday life, that's not a conscious thought that we have. We don't walk around thinking, I'm just not, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Right? <laughs> How it shows up. How it yeah. does show up is procrastination. And why it shows up at procrastination is we are afraid to take action. One, first of all, what if the action I take is not the right action? Okay. Mm -hmm. And right. then the second part of it is what if I do take the action and it still doesn't give me the results I want? I don't have what it takes to handle it because then it really means the truth, which is I'm not good enough. So rather than deal with that fear, we just avoid taking the action. I think a lot of people, when they're going through procrastination, I know when I go through procrastination, one story that I always just tell myself is I'm just lazy. I work a lot as well with coaching clients. And number one, they always say is, no, oh, I know what to do. I don't need any help. I'm fine. I'm fine. I just got to do it. I just got to do it. And then like next week, I'm like, okay, sure. And then next week we go down to accountability. Do you do it? And like, no, but this week I'm just going to do it. I know I just got to do it. This is what happened. They come up with a billion excuses over why it is. But you're saying is that the deeper part of this isn't really just, I just got to do it. I just got to willpower my way through it. Procrastination is not a laziness issue. It's an unworthiness issue. The reason for that is because we're afraid of dealing with the emotions that come up when mm -hmm. you take that action. Right. If you go to the gym, if you procrastinate on going to the gym, we all know we need to go to the gym to get fit. But we oh, all procrastinate on it. Why? Yeah. One, we don't want to feel the physical discomfort of when we go to the gym. But the emotional discomfort is what if I do all of this work and I still don't lose the weight, which then means ultimately I don't have what it takes. I'm just broken and that's a fact and nothing can be fixed. Go we on. don't want to face that discomfort and that fear. So we just call it I'm lazy. Yeah. So you said that this all comes back to when we were kids and we had this. Can you explain that a little bit more? Okay. So I read this amazing phrase where it said trauma basically just means it was a different experience to what you expected and you didn't have the tools to handle it. That's what trauma is. As a child, I had a great childhood. If you'd asked me a few years ago, I'd have said, no trauma, I'm perfectly fine, right? Yeah. But then you start to chip away the layers. And what I found was these, ins what I called insignificant memories. So this is not even a blip in mm -hmm. my consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. But in fact, affecting my everyday actions, relationships, mm -hmm. my mood, my feelings, all of it. So to give you an example, one of the things was my uncles used to call me Blackie. When I was growing up, I had really dark skin. And in India, fair skin is deemed as more beautiful and more worthy of beauty than oh. dark skin. So as a joke, and they would say this laughingly and then tease me, right? They would call me Blackie. I didn't realize how much of an impression it had left on me until my adult years. And I was talking to my life coach and during a meditation, this came up. I was crying at this memory. I was like, I'm surprised one, first of all, this memory came up and two, that I'm so upset about it because these are just things people do all the time in India. It's really normal. You're know, like, but no, as a child, this rocked your world. Think about how small the world is for a child, which is just her caregivers, mm -hmm. right? And you absorb everything these people are telling you about the world and how it works. This happened when I was probably three years old that they call me this. 
So from that point in my life, I had carried a small wound inside of me that had said, because of how you look, you're not worthy. Wow. And so mm -hmm. that to this day, until it's healed, will show up as lack of confidence and worthiness and all these other things that we're talking about, like perfectionism, procrastination. This tiny little fracture is amazing the rift it creates between the person you desire to be and the person who you actually are being. Is this color shaming or this color hierarchy, is this still very prevalent? You would say, uh, yeah? 100% yes. There are skin lightening creams in India. And if when you see like Bollywood portrayal, which is the Indian version of Hollywood, all the main lead actresses that are cast are all really fair skinned. Mm. So that they skin could almost be white. So why do they do that? It's because that will bring in butts to the seats in the movie theaters because the lead lady is more attractive. As a young girl, you're watching this. And subliminally, you're getting the message of, oh, my, my skin color is not good enough to be represented up there. So therefore, I'm not good enough. My right. skin color means I will never be good enough. Right. And it's not just I'm not good enough that I'm not pretty enough, but necessarily does that also influence I'm not good enough, therefore, at anything else? Part of your enoughness comes from your identity and your identity comes from how you look. Right. Part of it is how you look, whether you like it or not. Right. Like it has like this, just the web. It just when you start looking at it, it's in everything. Oh gosh, yeah. That's a good point because we don't really contextualize. So, oh, I'm not good enough at a, but I could still be great at B. We just feel this general worthiness. Your parents and your environment shape this belief of where you're ranking. We just feel bad about it. Yeah. So the obvious link to the example that I have just given you for my mm -hmm. personal life would be, I'm not pretty sure. enough, right? I don't feel pretty enough. I'm not right. beautiful enough, which then might affect the type of partner I attract mm -hmm. or the confidence I show up in relationships. Right. Right. But the subtle ways it shows up was in my own business as a life coach, I was hiding. I was scared to show up on like video and things like that. I would start off, I would have a strong start and then I would self-sabotage on things. And then I would disappear off of social media for days. And that part of that pattern I realized was linked to the fact that I didn't feel good enough to be seen because I wasn't right. pretty enough. There are really subtle ways that wounding from when you're a young child will show up in every aspect right. of your so life. So I don't want to write that article. I don't want to film that video. Not And we create stories around, oh, like I'm just too busy today. Oh, I don't know what the right thing. But really it comes from what if I put it out and it confirms what I was taught when I was a kid that I'm not good enough. But it's all unconscious. It's just all under the water. Exactly. That's going through. Exactly. Is it something that a lot of your clients have brought to you or that you've dug in and ex excavated for them? Yeah, it's usually that I excavate <laughs> for them and I help them connect the dots right. because when they come to me, their problem is, oh, I just get angry all the time at my kids. I wish I had more patience. Hmm. I just seem to get more and more upset easily these days. I don't hmm. know why. I want to be more confident hmm. at work. Hmm. I feel like I'm getting more and more lazy these days. I don't have any confidence. So that those are all, the, they come to me with right. the symptoms yeah. and they just, they think I'm going to tell them what to do. And I'm like, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to change the way you feel about yourself. Because when you do that, then the, what do I do becomes a lot easier and you'll be much mm. clearer. And how do you do that with them? In the beginning, I have a four step process. So the stage one is always awareness, like awareness of your mm -hmm. thoughts, how you think is so important and how you talk right. to yourself affects everything right. in your life. So it's like turning on a switch, an internal switch. And once they, they do that switch, they can't turn right. it off. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't realize I was so mean to myself or the thing that my kid does, I have no idea why, but it really triggers me. Can you help me understand that more? So that's the first stage. The second part of it is what I call uncovering. Mm -hmm. And that's when we start to connect the mm -hmm. dots as to why are you the way you are? It's not because you're broken. Mm. It's not because you're inherently like wired <laughs> wrong. It's not because you're just unworthy. It's not that. It's because of the relationship maybe you had with your caregivers or your parents. Like I just started with a brand new client the other day and she had no idea that she was so hard and critical about mm -hmm. herself until we uncovered how critical her dad used to be mm. of her. She just chalked it up to that's just my dad mm. until I started pulling out things from her 
And then linking it to the fact of you didn't feel safe to be you as a mm. child because you were constantly walking on eggshells, worried about what your father was going to tell mm. you. So no wonder it is today you don't have a clear opinion or a strong opinion on anything. One of the things she doesn't like herself for is I change my mind all the time based on what's going mm -hmm. on around me. Like, I don't even truly know what it is mm. that I want. And she thought, I'm just built mm. wrong. You're not built wrong. You were born knowing what it is your desires were. It was just pushed out of you because of your environment and your circumstances. Mm -hmm. So once I like, connect to the dots, it was like so much relief. Mm. So we realized that it's not so much that we don't know. Because I know so many people who have experienced that as well. Is that like they constantly overthink every decision. And the source of that when they were kids, oftentimes they were taught that either their decisions weren't the right ones or that because they're dealing with parents were causing the question, they learned not to trust their own inner voice or inner guidance. Yeah, or they grew up in an environment where, like I said, it didn't feel safe to be themselves. Mm -hmm. If you have a parent who has an anger problem, then as a child, you don't focus on how can I be my <laughs> most self. You are walking on eggshells making sure that you don't do anything to upset right. that parent. What's a healthy so you should What should the parent be doing in this kind of situation? Oh, I love this question. As somebody who has gone through the healing journey and I have two kids of my own, I often ask myself this question. If I don't want my kids to repeat the same struggles 100%. that I've had, how do I yeah. parent them? So part of it is creating a really safe environment for your kids to express themselves. Mm. So I have been blessed with one child who, I have two boys, but one of them is prone to like really intense emotional outbursts, which means he experiences anger and rage. Nobody in my family has ever had before that I can remember. So as a mother on the receiving end of it, it feels really scary. And the normal instinct is to tell that child to keep quiet, go to your room, calm down, don't come down until yeah. like you yeah, control this. Anger, the corner. Right? When we say that, what we're really saying to the child is your emotions are too intense. You should be ashamed of having them because that's why I'm sending you to your room and you are unpleasant mm -hmm. to be around. Don't have these feelings. That's the sub that's the message I'm sending him if I do the traditional mm -hmm. thing. But instead, what I do is I reflect back to him. I go, I can see you're really upset with me right now. That's OK. I can see you're really disappointed that I said no and you are really angry about that. And I respect that. So really validating the emotion and the feeling and the reaction that our kids have is so mm. important because it tells them it's okay for me to have these emotions and then channeling that physical anger that he might be feeling into a safe way. So before I used to tell him, calm down, breathe, which like nobody wants to calm down and breathe when <laughs> yeah. you're in the middle of a meltdown. That's the worst thing you can say to anyone. <laughs> now what I do is I focus on my own regulation. So I start taking deep mm. breaths. Even though he is having a major meltdown, mm. when I focus on my own breath, guess what? Within a couple of minutes, he starts to regulate. Mm, interesting. Himself. So he's modeling you. He noticed this mom is breathing to keep her own self-control. Mm. Like I can see I'm upsetting her. So maybe I can do the same. Like without saying any of this out loud. There's also scientific research that shows when you do heart breathing, which is six seconds in and six seconds out. It actually sends like electromagnetic waves from mm. your heart and it regulates anyone that's in your surroundings too. Wow, that's fascinating. So there is a modeling happening because I think a lot of parents probably know this is that you can tell your kids all sorts of things, but they're going to learn from what you do, not from what you say. Exactly. So when you start doing your own work and you start regulating your own emotional experiences, they go, oh, okay, that's how you do it. And they can also process because being in a state of anger is not something that kids necessarily want to be in all day. They also want to learn how to get out of it. Yeah. Because what happens when you tell your kid to shut up or calm down and you shut that mm. box, right? Like emotions are coming out and you're telling that child to repress it and suppress it yeah. and put it away. That emotion, which is just yearning to be expressed and expelled from their body, you have now locked it in their body by telling them to right. shut up. Because you're not letting them express it. It has nowhere to go but stay yeah. in their body. Because you're not telling them how and to you... deal with the experience of what they're going right. through. You're just telling them how you want them to experience with you. You're just saying, I just, I only care about how you look and how you are to me. I don't care about what you're experiencing. Wow. The analogy that I'm, that I'm thinking of, it's like imagining a kid wanting to go to the bathroom 
And instead of teaching them how to go to the bathroom and use a toilet, instead, we're, it's just use a kind of a gross example. We could probably think of a better example. But instead of dealing with that, or, or if a kid comes to you and saying, I'm hungry, you're teaching them, here's how you stop being hungry. Don't talk about it. Instead of going, no, let's go exactly. to the kitchen and make yourself a snack. Exactly. No, those are amazing <laughs> examples. I wouldn't have been able to parent the way I mm. parent unless I had addressed my own childhood mm. wounds. I can give out these techniques all day long mm -hmm. to parents, but if you're unwilling to do the internal work of healing your own childhood mm -hmm. wounds, these techniques will not be sustainable and you're not going to get the type of results that I have experienced right. myself. So you said there's four stages before. You said the first stage is awareness. What's the second stage? So that's the uncovering mm -hmm. stage where you start connecting right. the dots as to, oh, I'm not inherently broken. I was just shaped this way because of what happened to me. The third stage is what I call becoming an embodying. The final three and four is actually integrated together. So becoming is really stepping into the person you knew you were always meant mm. to become. So you start shifting your mindset and your beliefs. So your belief might go from, I'm really lazy mm. to now the new thought you have is, I think I can do this. I, I, I'm capable of it. Let me just mm. try. So it's like a stair step effect of how do we now, I'm aware of my patterns and my habits instead of thinking the mm -hmm. negative way. How can I become more accepting of myself? And how does that then impact the self-talk that I have and the thoughts that I have about what I'm being mm -hmm. capable of? So that's the becoming stage. You're like really stepping into yeah, this yeah. version, right? You're not quite there yet, but you are becoming. And then the last part is what I call embodying, which is where it's in your body, the changes. What, that's what does that when... mean? How do we get into our body? <laughs> I'm in my body. <laughs> this is something I wouldn't have been able to answer until about a couple of years ago when I went through my breastwork facilitation mm -hmm. program. So many of us are completely disassociated from our bodies. What that means is I process everything that I see in this world through just my head, which is my brain, my mind, my eyes, and maybe my ears. And we ignore 80% of this body that lives below our necks. So everything gets processed through my eyes and what I hear it goes into my brain. I make sense of it, analyze it, and then I move through the world based on that. But our intuition, our genius, our creativity, our joy, all the feelings we want in the world, happiness, joy, gratitude, bliss, all of these feelings that we crave, guess what? They're not thoughts. They're feelings mm. and they're emotions and emotions and feelings are felt in our bodies, not thought in our mm. minds. And that's part of the reason that I was so unhappy for a long time because I kept thinking about happiness. But if you'd ask me then, what does happiness feel like to you? I promise you there are physical sensations that are attached to every single emotion we have. So if I'm sitting here and just processing your question just now, I can actually, this is a very different question, right? Because when I think, what does happiness look like? I think, oh, I'm on a yacht with my friends and fancy food. But what does happiness feel like? It might be, I feel lightness in my chest. I feel bounce in my body. I feel, I feel relaxation in my shoulders. And that's a very different experience. Exactly. Huh. Fascinating. Exactly. It's actually much easier if you're new to this work. And if this is a new concept you're hearing about, it can be really hard to go straight to happiness because a lot of us live in a world where we are unhappy and discontent. So to start associating, getting back into your body, ask yourself, when I feel angry, how does that feel in my mm. body? Anger, a lot of times we clench up, we tighten, our shoulders get drawn right. in, our breath starts to get short. A chest might feel tight. You might clench your stomach. Yep. So that is you when you start to notice, oh, this is what anger feels like in mm. my body. That's actually a huge right. win because now you're not just thinking angry thoughts. You're now feeling angry in your body. And when we feel it in our bodies, we actually have more power over letting go of that anger than just thinking about mm. letting go of wow. anger. I love that. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. I want to ask you're you, welcome. I know that you work in particular with South Asian women. And I'm really curious about that. What are some experiences that South Asian women have brought to you that you have seen come up that is different, perhaps, or maybe that's not the right word for it? Or what are some of the bigger experiences that they have brought to you? I would say the things that are unique to South Asian women are they are extremely high accomplishers mm. in terms of achievement, right? They are so mm. driven, so ambitious, incredibly intelligent, but they are the first person who will also say, oh, but I'm not good enough. Mm. I could never do that. 
So the amount of self-criticism is extremely high in South mm. Asians. It's like disproportionate. Mm. I have, having worked in Microsoft, I was the only brown woman on my team. And the level of self-confidence that I saw in the white women compared to what I felt, it was two different universes. Mm. And I was always shocked because I would be doing the same quality of work that these women were doing. And they would be standing there and talking about how wonderful their work. And it was, I'm not saying it wasn't, but they had no qualms about getting up in a room full of people and talking about how wonderful their work is and how wonderful they are. And I would be sitting there cringing. I'd be like, you shouldn't be able to say that about yourself. Your boss should be talking about how mm. great you are. So this idea of external validation mm, right. and recognition, yeah. that's huge in South Asian mm. culture, where you cannot talk and brag about mm -hmm. your own work. Your parents have to do it or your teachers have mm. to do it. Your elders have to do it. And that's when you're worthy of that success and that mm. achievement. And this is impacting their work experiences as well? Absolutely. Because their boss is saying, look, you're doing great work, but you don't talk about it. You don't bring it to the table and you don't share your magic with the team. That's a lot of the feedback that I got. They were like, you're too quiet. Like you're doing great work with mm. your clients, but you're not bringing the learnings to us. You're not talking about what are the new ideas that you came up with to make this happen. Because I kept expecting my boss to do that part of it. I've already done the work. Like, you, should, <laughs> you should recognize me, my yeah. genius. You're just waiting there. You guys are both waiting for each other to praise the work. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so there's so much right. self-doubt in this, am I mm. good enough? And the solution to that is to go through the process and look at the conditioning, look at the culture that led to it, and then leading through the phases into embodiment. Is that right? That's right. And sorry, going back to the original question that you'd asked, the other thing that I see that's very unique to South Asian women is this idea of because I'm a girl, hmm. I am secondary in terms of importance. So in Indian culture, girls from the beginning are deemed as a burden in overt ways and subtle ways because of the idea of if you have a girl, then when she gets married, the family has to give a certain amount of money to the groom's side. It's, dowry is illegal. That's what was called a dowry, but it's now illegal. But before people used to ask outright, okay, if you're going to marry, bring your daughter into our family, like what are you going to wow. give? in addition to right. <laughs> That's all the dowry, right? So yeah. in India, there are still communities that grieve when they have oh, a baby God. girl. I can't imagine yeah. the, the unconscious so, messaging behind that to grow up as a, yeah. Boys are celebrated and girls are grieved over. That didn't personally happen to me mm -hmm. in my family. I have an older brother, but all the messaging that you get from everywhere. Yeah. You can't yeah. escape it. So when my clients come to work with me, there is this idea of I'm a burden right. to others. And part of the, I have to work really hard to achieve anything in my life. And the perfectionism stems from that generational trauma, whether you personally experienced it or not. Our mothers did, our grandmothers did, our aunts and our great grandmothers. And it goes back wow. generations where women have had to justify mm -hmm. their existence. And so if I just worked really hard and gave everything I have, then maybe that will justify and make it okay for the fact that I might oh be a burden to you. Just for the right. right to exist, as opposed to being celebrated as a member of the family. Wow. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. So previously yeah. you talked about the idea of embodiment. And I think to some people, this might be a new term in and of itself, but to sit in that can you talk about what that looks like in terms of how can we start embodying that and stop procrastinating and start having that unstoppable faith in who we are that we can wake up with zero self-doubt and just go, I'm ready to take on the world. So I love this word embodiment, right? Because it means to integrate into your body. My mentor talks about this concept, Samantha Kelly, oh, who you great. know. Kelly. She talks about not having a top-down approach, but a bottoms-up approach. And I'm going to tell you what that means. So oftentimes when we want to become something, we have the thought of, oh, I really want to maybe let's say weight loss is the easiest one. I want to become thin, right? I want to lose weight. And then, which then means I have to go to the gym. That means our body then becomes moving, right? It goes to the gym to move. So you're sending the thought of I need to lose weight. And then you push that thought down to your body and then you get your body mm -hmm. to the gym. That sounds yeah. very logical, but that's a top-down approach. Your body is taking command from your mind, which is an uphill battle. But what if we could help our bodies feel healthy before we even get to the gym, feel worthy 
of having the sexiness or the good lookingness, right. right? What if we felt pretty and beautiful before we begin in our bodies, then our mind then takes a command from our bodies of, I want to be vibrant. I want to be mm. healthy. And then you go to the gym. So now it's a bottoms up mm. approach. So how do we do that? So that's through mm. breath work. Breath work is an amazing modality that helps you get into a deeper state of consciousness very quickly. We cannot keep doing the same thing over and expect mm. different results. And so in order to create different results, we have to have different thoughts and different feelings and emotions in our bodies. And so when we do breath work, what happens is you tap into this unconscious parts of you that one shows you where is the wounding in my body that's preventing me from becoming the person I wanna be? So it could be one of the personal experience memories that I've shared. A lot of that has come through breath work. Where your body literally goes, here's this memory, deal with it. And it's really painful. You're like, I don't wanna go back there and yep. feel those feelings. But like I said, those feelings are already trapped in your body and that's what's preventing you from becoming the person you are meant to be. By going into your breath, you bring it to your awareness, you bring it to the surface of, oh, I don't even know what this memory has to do with anything, but I'm gonna go into mm -hmm. it anyway. I'm gonna feel the things that I didn't want to feel at that time. So you might feel grief, you might feel heartbreak. And then your memory actually changes the way you feel about what happened actually changes because now you've gone back into mm -hmm. that. And there's a lot of science on how memories can actually change and the intensity and the hold the memory has when you go back on your own terms, right? So through breath work, you're going back into memory, but you're setting the intention of, I'm healing this. I'm gonna look at this a different way. So then you unlock the energy that's trapped and it gets released out of your body into the ethos, right? For it to be transmuted into something greater, which now has created space for that new belief and that new emotion to come in, which is, oh, what happened really had nothing to do with me. Maybe that's what you come away with. So you get to change how that memory plays mm. out. And when that happens, guess what? The change has now happened on a body and a cellular level. So now you take a different kind mm. of action. So what's the actionable? Let's say I'm listening to this. What's something I could do today now as a practice that I could take with me? <laughs> okay, so one of the easiest ways that you can start getting into breath work is what I call the sigh breath or the screaming oh breath, depending on your intensity of whether you're feeling anger or frustration. So if you're frustrated, go with the sigh. If you are really angry, go with okay. the scream. <laughs> So all you're gonna do, assess first of all, how are you feeling? Like, how am I feeling right now on a one to 10? 10 being, I feel really great. One being, I just feel really down and heavy. Take a self-assessment and then you take a deep breath and then a sigh breath is you're gonna exhale through your mouth with a loud sigh. <sighs> ah, and you're gonna do that 10 to 20 times. And I guarantee you, you're gonna feel a shift in the heaviness, and maybe the worry and the stress and the tightness that you've been holding in your body. Whenever there's so much just mental chatter going on in our heads, like you're just like, oh my God, like I wish I could make this stop. Use the side breath and imagine all those thoughts being exhaled out with the sound of your own sigh and that mm -hmm. breath and the scream breath is the exact same thing but instead of a sigh you can do a silent scream or a loud scream based on whether you're feeling <laughs> your house or not. maybe grab a pillow scream into a pillow that might work too but some days i've done it when my nobody's at home and I love myself <laughs> brilliant as long as you're not waking yeah. up any concerned neighbors or getting the cops called having that space yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i've done the silent scream of like really opening your mouth wide and how you would normally so cool. scream so it's Amazing. so good. Okay, fantastic, Riza. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us here today and sharing all this wisdom. Is your website still www.visalakshi.com? Correct. It's www.visalakshi.com, okay. but I hang out most often on like TikTok okay. and Instagram. Okay, fantastic. Go find so, her. For the people who are at home who may not have access to show notes right now, what's your Instagram handle so that they can quickly pull out your phones right now and head over to Instagram and punch in... It, life coach at visa. life coach visa perfect thank you so much yep. visa for your time we're so appreciative of your messaging and everything that you have shared with us today guys go check out visa's website and all of her free resources and her teachings on her instagram and tiktok thank you once again for your time visa thank you i had so much fun <laughs> awesome